911, do you have an emergency? Hi, uh, uh, yes, there's somebody stuck in a sewer over here on Atlantic. What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we will be exploring three unbelievable cases of missing people discovered in extremely bizarre circumstances that will leave you wondering just how these events could happen. Let's get into it. The first case we have for you today is one that you may have stumbled across in recent headlines, though you may not have realized just how bizarre the story truly is. Around 9 a.m. in Delray Beach, Florida, on Tuesday, March 23, 2021, a pedestrian passed over Atlantic Avenue. They paused in their walk as something appeared to be off, though they weren't quite sure what it could be at first. Then they heard it, the muffled noise of what sounded like someone yelling. Somehow, the voice seemed to be coming from below the street the pedestrian realized in shock that someone had to be trapped in the storm drain below the busy Delray Beach thoroughfare. Realizing that something was seriously wrong, they began shouting for help. Another passerby saw the commotion as she drove through the area, and with her window of her car rolled down, she heard the trapped person screaming. This passerby called 911 to report the bizarre situation. When told that someone was trapped in the sewer, the 911 operator can be heard incredulously asking what is going on. In the background of the call, the woman who is trapped in the storm drain can be heard shouting up to those who found her. She yells that she is not hurt. 911, do you have an emergency? Yes, there's somebody stuck in a sewer over here on Atlantic in uh, sorry, 11th Avenue. Somebody stuck in There's a the lady sewer. stuck in a sewer. Yes, okay. ma'am. She cannot get out. She's screaming for help. How did she get in there? I'm not sure. I don't know. She was just screaming for help, and the lady was walking, and she, I, like, I had my window down. I was driving, and she heard her screaming. We heard her screaming, so. All right, we have help the 30 on the way. Can you see any visible injuries on her? You hurt? No, no, she ain't hurt. She just don't got on her clothes. Police and the Delray Beach Fire Rescue responded to the scene where they began trying to move the grate over top of the storm drain in order to see what was going on below. By this time, a small crowd had gathered at the scene. What they found inside the drain was a naked 43-year-old woman. Using a ladder and harness, the rescue team was able to get access to the eight-foot deep drain underneath the road and carefully bring the woman up to safety. When she was finally raised up to the ground level, the gathered crowd cheered. The woman appeared relatively unharmed, though dehydrated. Danny Moschella from the Delray Beach Fire Rescue said that the woman struggled when she attempted to stand up and ultimately was unable to stand on her own. Moschella described that she was very dirty, she had some superficial wounds, her knees were all scraped up. When taken to the hospital, the woman explained to police how she ended up trapped in the drain in the first place. Police documents revealed that she claimed to officers she had been swimming in a canal that was located near the housing complex where her boyfriend lived. While swimming, she said that she noticed a doorway in the shallows of the canal which opened to a tunnel. She then became curious to see where the tunnel led. Following into the first tunnel, the woman found another and then another, and soon she realized that she had become lost and couldn't find her way out again. According to police documents, the woman claimed that while in the tunnels, she found an unopened can of ginger ale, which she drank, but it is currently unknown if she had anything to eat while she was trapped. At first, it was believed that the woman had been trapped in the drains for a few days, perhaps a little longer. But what is most bizarre about this case is that the woman claims that she first went into the tunnels on March 3rd, almost three weeks before she was found. If she was correct, that would mean she had been wandering around in the tunnels for about 20 days 
This seems almost unbelievable. What brings credence to her story, however, is that some news sources say that she was reported to be missing in a different county almost three weeks prior to her discovery. The woman finally found her way out when she saw a glimpse of light, which would turn out to be the grate from which she was eventually pulled out. Police say that she saw people walking by through the grate and decided to sit down and call for help. The spokesperson for the Delray Beach Police Department, Officer Ted White, said that officers at the scene agreed that this event was by far the most bizarre incident they ever responded to. The woman's situation could have easily become critical if the area had received any significant rain, or if she had wandered into a smaller rain pipe, which could have resulted in her drowning or seriously injuring herself. According to police documents, the woman has since been released from the hospital to recover at her home in the care of her mother. Her mother described her daughter as having a history of doing odd things and making bad decisions. While the police officers noted that the woman appeared lucid after she was rescued, they are still unsure of the accuracy of her statements and exactly how long she really was within the tunnels. Police sources reveal that it is entirely possible that the truth of how she ended up in the storm drain, or just how long she was trapped down there, may never be known. Though her story leaves many questions unanswered, one thing is for certain, the woman is lucky to be alive under the circumstances. The next case we have for you is one that is likely every parent's worst nightmare. In 2013, a two-year-old little girl mysteriously vanished. On October 8th, around 2 p.m., Amber Smith was reported missing after she was said to have wandered out of her family's house in Nuego County, Michigan. Her family included several siblings and her parents, Dale and Diane Smith. At the time that she made it out of the house, her mother had been at work, while her father was in a different room. When he returned, he found Amber missing. Her panicked father set out in search of her. He looked for half an hour to no avail before contacting authorities and reporting that she was missing. What was most concerning was that the Smith family home was near dense woods and it appeared that Amber had wandered into the trees. It wasn't entirely unusual that Amber had made it out of the house as she was reportedly known to have done so on previous occasions in the past. Those times, however, she hadn't become lost. At first, suspicion turned to the father, but the possibility of him being involved in the little girl's disappearance was quickly ruled out. Police were clear that they were unaware of any previous incidents when they had been called to the Smith home or of any past trouble regarding the parents or any children. As news spread about the missing two-year-old, volunteers crowded onto a bus at Hawkins Township Hall to aid in the search for the little girl. Just under 300 people in total showed up to help in the efforts. Police employed the use of a helicopter, off-roading vehicles, and a tracking dog in the search, hoping that it would be able to backtrack her scent and determine the path that she would have taken from her home. The woods that Amber wandered into are described as being pitch black at night and 42 degrees, and so the search and rescue efforts were intent on finding her before dark. Despite a coordinated and intensive search effort, there was no sign of Amber anywhere in the woods. In fact, it appeared as if she had vanished into thin air. But 24 hours later, miraculously, Amber was found by police and Department of Natural Resources conservation officers the next afternoon, near 12 Mile Road and Cedar Avenue. This area is within the boundaries of the Manistee National Forest. When they discovered her, it was reported that the little girl was simply standing alone in the middle of the woods next to a fallen tree. Reportedly, Amber was crying when she was first found, but calmed down as soon as she was approached by a conservation officer 
and realized she was safe. Amber was reportedly dressed in only a tank top, without shoes or pants. It was reported by news outlets that her father had been the one to find her pants outside of their house on the day that she went missing. The police have stated publicly that they believe she took them off herself. Amber's mother spoke to a news outlet and said that the discovery of Amber alive and safe was the best day of the family's life and that her mind had been racing over whether or not she's going to be alive or dead. The Nuego County Undersheriff Brian Boyd described the discovery as a welcome surprise. While at the hospital for evaluation, Amber appeared to be surprisingly calm and simply asked for some hot chocolate. When Amber was examined, scratches were found on her body which the Undersheriff Boyd described as being consistent with her walking a long distance through the woods. Though the conclusion to the case was a happy one, it was unexpected and uncommon. Speaking to this, Under Sheriff Boyd said, It's hard to imagine how a two and a half year old can survive that distance through the woods with that kind of temperature. To make it from her house to where Amber was found, she would have had to walk about one and three quarter miles and crossed at least one road. However, what was most troubling for those who found Amber was trying to figure out not only how the young girl had managed to survive the night alone in the woods relatively unharmed, but also how had those looking for her not found her when they went over the area earlier. If Amber had been there, it was assumed that they would have found some clue indicating it. Under Sheriff Boyd described the circumstances as very suspicious. When he interviewed Amber, he hoped to see if she could explain how she had managed to get to the place where she was located on Wednesday. However, he said, I don't think she's old enough to really comprehend things. I don't think she can formulate reason. Amber's father, Dale, went on to share that the police had told him that they discovered evidence of tire tracks near where Amber was found. However, that lead hasn't resulted in anything conclusive. For now, many questions remain about what happened to Amber over those 24 hours when she was gone, where she had been, and most importantly, had someone taken her? Currently, there are no definite answers. The final case we have for you today is one that may be the most bizarre of all. 23-year-old Stephen Kubaki was a student attending Hope College in 1978. As an avid outdoorsman, the student often liked to spend days at a time out in the wilderness. In February of 1978, Stephen decided to go solo cross-country skiing near Sagatuck, Michigan for a few days. When he didn't return at the time that he told his parents he would, they became concerned and alerted authorities to the fact that they believed their son could be missing. An investigation uncovered something very odd. The investigators found 200 yards of footprints, but no sign of Stephen. His parents told authorities where Stephen had claimed he would be exploring, and footprints were discovered exactly where Stephen had said he would be. But concerningly, the footprints led all the way to the edge of the frozen lake, where they stopped. There was no sign that Stephen had walked away. Rather, it looked like he had paused at the edge of the water and then simply vanished. There was also no evidence that the ice had been broken. So where had Stephen gone? Despite the evidence, the main conclusion had been that Stephen had simply lost his balance and fallen into the lake where he became trapped under the sheet of ice and drowned. On February 21st, his abandoned skis and backpack were found. The case was never closed, and though he wasn't stated to be officially dead, he was presumed to have died in that icy lake. Then, one year and three months later, Stephen returned. On May 5th, 1979, Stephen reportedly claimed that he had woken up 
and realized that he was laying in the middle of a field in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He was 700 miles from the location where he was believed to have vanished. Later, when speaking to reporters, Stephen told them that when he woke up, he found that he was wearing strange clothes that were not his own, and that he had a backpack with him that was filled with maps, which he reportedly interpreted to mean that there had been extensive hiking or traveling done since he had disappeared. As well, it was reported that he found he had a t-shirt from a marathon in Wisconsin that he had no recollection of ever running in. Apparently, after he woke up, Stephen had no idea how much time had gone by since he vanished until he walked to find a newspaper. According to various news outlets, Stephen claimed to have absolutely no memory of what happened to him over those 15 months, nor any idea where he had been. The last thing that he claims to remember was his footprints in the snow, the ones that investigators discovered. At the time, Stephen's story made headlines and fascinated the public. Stephen only added fuel to the speculative fire when he frequently declined to talk publicly about what had happened to him and often outright refused to give any interviews. One main theory was that Stephen had simply chosen to run away and later changed his mind and returned. But rather than admit it, he had come up with an elaborate hoax. On the odd occasion when Stephen spoke to reporters, he insisted that he had no reason to choose to disappear. Stephen said that before he had gone on his doomed cross-country skiing trip, everything in his life was going well. He said, My father was going to sign over the house to me. I had three courses at school and no trouble. I left a romance in Germany. There was no trouble with girls. I had a job lined up with the Holland Sentinel newspaper. He also reiterated that he has no memory whatsoever about those 15 months. There has been much speculation about what happened to Stephen, some of the theories more outlandish than others. The possibilities of UFOs and alien abduction have been tossed around, as well as the chance that Stephen hit his head and suffered brain damage or that he blacked out for over a year and wandered around the wilderness as another person. Divine intervention has been posited as a possible explanation. Other theories focus on the area where Stephen went missing and assume that he was a victim of a geographical phenomenon known as the Lake Michigan Triangle. This area has become infamous for disappearances similar to those of the Bermuda Triangle. What is apparent is that any of the numerous theories could be true, as there is so little evidence to prove or disprove any of them, and Stephen doesn't appear to have any answers himself. Stephen even eventually went back to Sagatuck in an attempt to bring back any memories about what happened to him, but he said that while there, nothing came back to him. Stephen eventually earned his PhD, Today, he reportedly works as a professor of psychology and runs a clinical practice. It appears that soon after he returned, he stopped speaking publicly about what happened to him. Is this because he simply cannot remember and wants to move on with his life? Or is there a chance that Stephen has slowly pieced together what happened over those 15 months and the events are too troubling for him to acknowledge publicly? We may never know. To this day, Stephen Kubaki's bizarre disappearance has never been solved.